Leaves from a Russian Diary. Pitterim Sorokin. Part 4. 1921-1922. Chapter 24. S. O. S. What we feared most of all for Russia in 1921 happened. Looking over a map of the whole country, with provinces marked by harvests bad or totally lacking, we said, 25 million people, at least, are fated to die of starvation this winter unless the world comes to their aid. We said this long before the government and Maxim Gorky issued their wild appeal to the nations of earth to help the starving masses. Who or what was to blame for this terrible Russian famine? We have a proverb which says, a bad crop is from God, a famine is from the people. There was a drought, it is true, but it did not cause the famine in all its horror. The communistic policy of plundering the peasantry, thus leading them, in self-defense, to reduce the area of cultivated land almost by half, the requisitions of calm, even to seed corn, in the dry areas, this policy must be held responsible for the most catastrophic features of the famine. Had the Soviet government not pursued this mad policy, and had it not so wrecked the railroad system that transportation of food and systematic relief was rendered impossible, that most appalling famine of 1921 would not have occurred. When it came, there was no remedy. No provinces had necessary surpluses of corn. Even if it had been willing to act, the government was powerless. Although they knew that they risked arrest, the intellectuals of Petrograd and Moscow immediately offered their services in what relief work was possible. The government at first allowed them to organize a committee for famine relief, but very soon, as we feared, the committee was arrested for counter-revolution. Their obsession of plots, and their desire for their own self-protection at any cost of human lives will stand forever as the hallmark of communistic tyranny. Having published my two volumes of A System of Sociology, I postponed the writing of the third volume in order to study at first-hand phenomena typical of the revolution, and to note them in such form as to make their investigation easier in normal times. With my students and collaborators, and in close cooperation with the academicians, Pavlov and Bektorev, I began an investigation of social changes, social groupings, and regroupings in our society. Included was the study of time budgets of our fellow men, and the comparative force of different factors in determining human behavior. The behavior of the people around me was stripped of inhibitions which in normal circumstances disguise its mechanism and make difficult its determination. As the principal object of my study, I took the influence of hunger upon human behavior, social life, and social organization. In the study of this problem I had had such personal experience, and the benefit of personal contact in my own environment. The influence of food and acute want of food on human behavior had never before been seriously investigated. Rich as was the material at hand, I cannot say that my environment was favorable to scientific study, as I was all the time under the necessity of disappearing in order to avoid arrest. But as investigation of the phenomena in normal times was out of the question, we decided in one way or another to fit ourselves to the unfavorable environment, and I am glad to say that many of us succeeded in our efforts. In the autumn of 1921 I, among many other professors, was forbidden by the Soviet government to teach. Left with no work except researches in the Institute of the Brain and in the Historical and Sociological Institute of the University, I felt myself comparatively free. I had studied city starvation, with myself as one of the subjects, and now I had a very great laboratory in the starving villages of Russia. In the winter of 1921 I started for the famine districts of Samara and Saratov provinces for a scientific investigation of starvation. I will acknowledge at once that in this intention I completely failed. No scientific study was I able to make, but I saw a famine, and know now what it means. What I learned in those awful provinces was far more than any investigation could have given me. My nervous system, accustomed to many horrors in the years of revolution, broke down completely before the spectacle of the actual starvation of millions in my ravaged country. If I came out less an investigator, I do not think I came out less a man, less an enemy of any group of men capable of inflicting such suffering on the human race. With one of the local teachers, my small group set out on foot from the last railroad station to visit the famishing districts of Samara province. 
we entered the village of N in the afternoon. This place was as though dead. Houses stood deserted and roofless, with gaps where windows and doors had been. The straw thatch of the houses had long since been torn away and eaten. There were no animals in the village, of course, no cattle, horses, sheep, goats, dogs, cats, or even crows. All had been eaten. Dead silence lay over the snow-covered roads until, with a little creak a sledge came in sight, a sledge drawn by two men and a woman and having on it a dead body. After drawing the sledge a short distance, they stopped and fell exhausted on the snow. Dully they looked at us as we approached, and with sick hearts we looked at them. I had seen starving faces in the cities, but such living skeletons as these three people I had never seen. In rags, shaking with cold, they were not white of visage, but blue, dark blue with yellow spots. God help you, we addressed them. Simply because it was necessary to say something. The lips of one man and the woman moved but nothing but a mumbling sound came from them. The third peasant, who seemed a little more alive, said. God? We forgot God and he forgot us. Where are you taking him? I asked, pointing to the dead body of the lad lying on the sledge. To that corn loft. Answered the peasant, looking towards a low building. There is plenty of corn there now. The other man and the woman tried to get up from the snow, but could not do it without our help. We offered to draw the sledge, and with the three peasants went on to the corn loft, the usual peasant grain receptacle, new and good. The strongest man, it appeared, was constable of the village, and he took out a key and unlocked the loft. There was plenty of corn there now, as he had said. Ten bodies, including three children, lay on the floor. Why do you put them here? we asked. The priest is five miles from us. He cannot come every day. We have not any horse to draw the dead to the church or the cemetery, so when the priest comes, once every fortnight, we have the funeral service here and afterwards, if we can, we bury them near our chapel. We carried the body in and laid it on the floor. The man and woman, parents of the lad, crossed themselves and silently went out. Soon they will come here also. Said the constable. How many have you brought here this last fortnight? we asked. About ten or fifteen. Before that more. Some ran away from the village. Where did they go to? Where their eyes were looking. Then as he locked the door he whispered. It is necessary to lock, they steal. Steal, what? Yes, to eat. That is what we have come to. In the village they guard the cemetery not to let the bodies be taken from the graves. Have any murders occurred for such a purpose? I forced myself to ask. Not in our village, but in others, yes. A few days ago in the village of G, a mother killed her child, cut off its legs, cooked and ate them. That is what we have come to. In the dusk of the early evening we walked to the house of the constable, passing a half-ruined building with the sign, school. Closed. I indicated. Who is there to teach now? All the children are dead or dying. New ones are not being born. Besides, the teacher ran away. There was no fuel, no books, no food. As we neared the house we met a man who looked like a maniac. Without a cap and clad in an old, unbuttoned coat, he shook his long hair and beard frenziedly and waved his arms as he walked. Ring the bell. He cried hoarsely. Ring the bell. They will hear. They will hear. Mad. Said the constable laconically. He is always ringing the bell of the chapel. He thinks the bell will wake up the world and make it come to save us. But nobody will hear, he added gloomily, not even God. As he spoke, the clanging of the church bell broke the silence of the dying village. In the darkness of the forlorn and forsaken Russian wild, this appeal to the world of a mad peasant wrung our hearts, reduced us to bitter weeping. Ding dong. Ding dong. Now quick and alarming like a fire bell. Ding dong. Ding dong. Slow and mournful as a funeral knell. Ding dong. Ding dong. For almost an hour it beat on our brains, our hearts. 
Then dead silence fell again. This s, o, s, of a mad peasant in the far interior of the land was heard. It crossed the ocean and beat on the hearts of the great American nation and brought relief that saved from cruel death at least ten million men, women, and children. God will forever remember that deed. God will forever bless that generous people. We entered the constable's house. It was dark and cold. With flint and steel the man struck fire and lighted the stove. In the faint light we saw a woman lying on the stove. Seeing us, she made an effort to get up, but we begged her to lie still. Our son died a month ago. Said the peasant simply. And since we have eaten all, I don't see how we can keep alive much longer. Have you sowed your land? A small field only, as much as we could. Excuse us that we have nothing to offer our guests. We gave a part of our bread to the constable and his wife, and they devoured it, crossing themselves and crying. Good God! Real bread! Real bread! God bless you for it! We spent the night in this house and next morning started for the next village. Be careful! Warned our host. In some of the villages the people have become quite mad and dangerous. Good luck. Thank you for the bread. Along the road piled with snowdrifts we set off for the church village. We saw no one until we came very near the village, when we met a man with a boy and a girl. In the name of God, give us something to eat. We are dying. They cried. We gave them a little bread from our scant supply, and asked where they were going. To the railway. They answered vaguely. And after that, where? I don't know where. Said the man. Are you not the commissaries? No, we are not commissaries. Why? They say the commissaries have food, and sometimes they take girls. Will you take my children? Unhappily we cannot do that, we said. Then if they don't die I must forsake them. Said the peasant despairingly. Perhaps some people will pick them up. We gave them a little more bread and parted. They will never reach the railroad. Said my companion. From the very beginning of the famine tens of thousands of people were driven from their homes and went out, where their eyes were looking, with no plans, no definite points of migration, with nothing except an impulse to flee away from death. By thousands they wandered, and finding neither food nor work, they fell down and died. In the next village and the next we saw the same awful picture. Death from starvation and its companion, typhus. People lying in their wretched houses, patiently waiting the end of suffering. Apathy broken only by delirium, and attempts of some women and girls to sell themselves for a little bread. In some of the villages we saw indisputable proofs of cannibalism. The revolution promised to save the people from despotism. The Bolsheviki promised to give food to everyone. If they did not keep those vows, at least they gave the people the communion of human sacrifice, human flesh and blood. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kine, and the flocks of thy sheep. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, pestilence. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her, thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look, and fail with longing for them all the day long. The fruit of thy land and all thy labours shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters. This ancient curse filled my mind all during my wanderings and for days after I returned to Petrograd. Not much scientific knowledge did I gain in those twenty days I spent in the famine regions, but the memory of what I saw and heard there made me afterwards absolutely fearless in denouncing the revolution and the monsters who were devouring Russia. Many and great have been the sins of the Russian people, but in these years of famine, 
suffering, and death, through all the punishments of God, the nation has expiated, has paid in full for all its offenses.